uh, difficulties in communication and sort of not having sufficient knowledge in local and state laws have led to overwhelming numbers of conflicts between families and schools. Too often we hear complaints from parents that schools are not willing to um, take these, invite these families as education partners. Um, and New York City already has a historically high number of pending legal complaints related to special education cases. So we're cu curious how you would work with your local schools and parent groups to foster equal partnership in special education and other educational opportunities for families with limited English proficiency uh, and with the cultural dif uh, differences. Uh, Richard, we'll start with you. I've always served as my parents' interpreter. We go to school, parent-teacher conference, I was always the person to explain what the teacher was saying. And I think this is uh, uh, very much the case for a lot of people in my age group because we didn't have access to those resources and we still don't. Uh, and I think we have to do a little bit better on that point. You know, Executive Order 120, which I helped pass several years ago, was supposed to create better language access uh, for individuals and families for all city services. Um, but that was, never actually, uh, that was never actualized. We have seen instances where they would use maybe like language line in order to uh, supplement it, but the city has done a uh, pretty bad job in ensuring that individuals of different backgrounds and different linguistic and cultural needs haven't been getting that access. And I think one thing we can do specifically with schools is improve upon that. Uh, we can expand the number of parent coordinators so that we have more languages covered in the area. We can't cover every language, but I think we could do a little bit better to cover the majority of uh, languages spoken. Uh, even in my school, we, uh, we try to do a little bit better. Uh, and uh, we are able to do that through the help of parents really coming in there. So that might be another way that we can sort of integrate more. You know, I'm a class parent and my wife was a class parent. And the only reason we were class parents is because we were one of the only individuals that was able to speak both English and my wife, you know, she speaks Mandarin, I speak Korean. And we were the only ones that were able to communicate between the school and all of our parents in our class, right? And so we have to do a little bit better to making sure that the school is able to provide that. And we can do this by creating greater access for parents to information and making sure the Department of Education is doing the same thing, that they are providing in-language support and in-language resources so that the parents can go back and say, all right, this is what's going on and understand exactly what to do uh, when uh, resources aren't coming down. And this is especially the case with special education parents, because during the pandemic, even until now, we have seen a wholesale gutting of essentially services that were needed for a lot of these parents and their students and their kids um, that were inaccessible and uh, not being provided and left in the limbo of not understanding what is going on during this time period. So I think we have to do better in terms of language access and we have to do better with uh, the Department of Education doing that. So um, I don't know, uh, thank you for the question. It's probably the most important question we're gonna deal with aside from crime is education. I don't know what school Mr. Lee went to, but internment camps and Japanese American history has been a part of our, the curriculum for New York City public schools for the past like 40 years. I, also, I also hold on, hold on. Also a third of the AP world history tests are fully covered on um, Asian and Eastern a Asian um, uh, um, nationalities. So the, the tests have been updated. They do reflect a very diverse New York. If you look at any of the regions, any of the AP tests, they do reflect the history of a true global city. So that's something that I would say that we always need to improve and expand on curriculum, but it's definitely in there. Nobody, I mean, there are, there are definitely marginalized groups in our curriculum, but only because our curriculum is so small and the world is so, is so big. Um, so, and moving on from that, we have quite a lot of money in the Department of Education. We spend, I mentioned before, over $26,000 per student per term. We have more than enough resources to get people the um, tools that they need in the languages that they need. I know that um, in my own work with the public school, there was always translations of every single form, always available for download, always available for print. The problem that we often see is that there's no liaison between the community to the school. So the fact that um, Mr. Lee and his wife had to be the community, the class parents, because they were in essence the liaison between that, that parent community and the school. We can and we do have positions for this, parent coordinators, right? The problem is that our schools don't have the, the type of um, budget, they have the budgetary restrictions that make it very difficult for principals to hire staff that they need. 
Um, and that's because of the bureaucracy of the city government. The city government holds, um, holds all the procurement money and they dole it out throughout the year. And instead of giving a school a regular budget and making them stick to that budget, and then that school can, um, can you know, proceed accordingly and say, okay, we need X amount of Bangladesh uh, translators, X amount of Korean translators. So that's something we need to do better. And that's why we're advocating for a free and um, a more accountable and transparent uh, Department of Education. Uh, the question was, can we get um, parents better access to the resources that we have available that English speaking parents or, for, or second generation parents are more easily accessible to? I'm a father. I'm a father of two young children. I'm a former teacher. I come from a family of educators. Being able to connect families with their schools, being able to provide all of our children, particularly the most vulnerable, particularly those with developmental disabilities and those who are disabled, is the most important thing that we can do. It is literally the difference maker. Um, education plays a role that is outsized, that is probably more important than anything else that we can do for our children, and we have to do a better job. I think that we should be first providing free translation services to all parents whose first language is not English, particularly those in our Korean American, our broader Asian American community. So we better connect parents with their schools and with the educators. Um, I think that we need to be able to allow parents to opt in to receiving translation services for anything that is going out to them, whether we're talking about permission slips, report cards, Cards, parental notifications, everything has to be brought to them in a language that they're comfortable, particularly if their primary language is not English. Now, specifically to those parents that are parents of, of developmentally disabled children, um, we have to do a much better job of managing the city's process. And I think it, become, it boils down to three things. One, I'd like to see a full investigation of the, um, of the office of, um, of, the, office of uh, the impartial hearing office. There are far too many cases where parents have no idea what's going on with the special planning and the strategic planning programs for their children. We need to, two, figure out how to bring down caseloads so parents will get much more attention and they'll get a lot more one-on-one -on -one help. And number three, we need to increase the budget allocations and the resources specifically around language access, around parental guidance, um, and around legal resources to ensure that a child's rights are never being trampled on because a parent doesn't have access to everything that was in our, within our system to help them. Special education is an important part of the educational system of the city of New York. Unfortunately, I don't think the, the Department of Education has been doing a good job in this respect. Uh, and as was mentioned, there have been a number of lawsuits that parents feel their children are not getting the resources that they're supposed to under the law. Um, the city council has oversight over the city agencies. Um, I don't think it's been doing a good job. Even when I was in the city council, I always thought we should do more oversight. That's the key for the next city council, more oversight. Now, in terms of the schools in District 19, 25 and 26 are some of the best schools in the, in the entire city, but we need to do a better job with special education. Um, I was always very proud of the fact that I worked with every principal and the teachers when I was in office, um, reaching out to them every year to see what their needs are, working with the parents association. And I would continue to do that. And because a lot of the schools in the 19th council district are not title one eligible, I always worked to bring extra money to the schools for these type of programs. And I would continue to do so. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, I believe in a hands-on approach. So my door would always be open to parents to meet with them, whether it's in the school or in my office or in their home to discuss these issues and get a real feel for how we can address them and make sure that the parents and the students who need help are getting it. At the peak of the uh, pandemic, uh, we witnessed that around 8 million of the 20 million loan program for struggling small businesses has been dispersed with 66% going to Manhattan based shops. How would you ensure that Korean and other Asian small businesses in District 19 are equally aided by New York City Council and other state funding opportunities? Um, uh, John, we're gonna start with you on this question. District 19 has an approximately 
thirty percent of our of our um, of our residents here, in capa one capacity or another, work for own a small business, a mom and pop business. They've been hit the hardest here because of COVID nineteen, uh, and it it's a double hit because not only have a, not a lot of these people been uh, readily accessible to the PPE loans, but they're also um, owner operators in terms of their whole business has declined. So for example, my business, we own a flower shop in Flushing across from Flushing Cemetery. We're down 40% for the year, right? And that, that's a trickle down effect. So um, what we need to do is create an environment in New York City where small businesses feel like it's worth it to open. Right now, small businesses are being taxed and feed to death by New York City. We have one of the largest, most bureaucratic uh, consumer uh, affairs uh, bureau, and not consumer affairs. Um, uh, oh my God, I just lost the train of thought. Um, the the, the uh, Richard, help me out. It's the department you use to open a, uh, a business. This All when you open up services. Business. Thank SBS. you, thank you very much. <laughs> He's on the ball. So um, it it makes it one of the most difficult places in the world, New York City, to open up a business. Right now, when we've seen 30 to 40% of our small businesses either take a cutback or, or we need to create an environment where people are getting rewarded for opening small business and incentivized for opening small businesses. So that's a problem district-wide um, and city-wide. All of New York is seeing a huge crisis now because of our own debt and our own um, budget. And we need some small business acumen to go in and fix the budget crisis that the city is facing. The approximately 90% of all businesses in New York City are small businesses. And for, I think, many in the Asian American community and the Korean American community, you know, they, they are vastly going to be small business owners if they are owner-occupied businesses. Uh, I think the issue that's going on right now is that the city uh, is uh, creating different mechanisms in order to generate revenue off the backs of small businesses. So as, men, as much as they can, they will place uh, unburdensome fines and violations and this is going at, on at a time right now when COVID has hit businesses the hardest. Now, I'm a small business owner. My wife and I, we own a small business, a cafe, a play cafe. And our business has been pretty much decimated uh, over the last year because it's a, it's a congregate place. Um, and there were very few resources being put out by the city. Uh, in last year's budget, the, the, uh, the, the mayor put $0 into small business grants and zero interest loans and is now putting in uh, resources for the next fiscal year. So we went a whole year without any services from the small business community. And at the same time, being over fined and over violation. Um, there are uh, a lot of uh, bureaucratic red tape that goes on because different agencies have different requirements. And a lot of small businesses, they don't understand or know that they are under infraction. And a lot of times it's for non-serious things like um, not having the correct log at a certain time. Right? And so I think what we have to do is stop looking at small businesses as revenue, right? The city has to stop thinking small business as revenue. That's like the most important thing and stop over finding and over violations uh, for these small businesses. The thing that I would like to propose is that anytime there is some sort of infraction uh, that would constitute a violation that would uh, cause the small business owner to be fined thousands of dollars or be forced to go into uh, oath, the court. Uh, instead, we gave a three to six month grace period so that if the small businesses fixes the issue, then they won't get any violations, no fines, nothing. It just solves the problem and we sort of move on because right now that is not happening. They would go in, get a fine, a thousand dollar buy, a thousand dollar ticket, and have to solve this and go to day in court at a time when small businesses are barely making it as it is. I think that's what we have to do. That we need to have legislation, which I would introduce, to analyze where the city dollars are going for these programs. Um, we clearly need to help small business. And the Asian community represents the largest part of the small business owners in the city of New York. We need to develop financial incentives to help them reopen, stay open, and to help people you know, regain their lost jobs. It's crucial that we do that. And I would work with my other colleagues in the, in the new city council to make that happen. They represent such a large part of the small business community. And one of the things that I've long advocated for, even when a small business owner is, is open, we need to do something long-term about lease renewal. A lot of times when the lease comes up for renewal, the landlord wants to increase rent four and five times the amount. And that's what happens to small business. They wind up closing 
because they can't afford the new lease. That has to change. And I've always supported mediation and um, arbitration for lease renewal. So we need to do something short term, but we also need to do something long term to help small business. I've always been very proud of the fact that small business organizations like the Small Business Congress has always supported me from my work in this regard. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy. They are crucial to revitalizing, reshaping, and bringing a renaissance to um, our, our economy. And the Asian American businesses have been hit particularly hard, and they've been a growing cohort of small businesses, new small businesses, and some of our most successful small businesses, particularly in Northeast Queens. What we need to do is think big when it comes to small business. I would like to create an Asian owned business division within the city's Department of Business Services, something that would work directly as a conduit, an ambassador, a liaison between Asian owned businesses and the various city agencies, helping them with procurement, helping them better access programs, contracts, resources, and regulatory assistance, language access to, particularly if there's a disconnect between fines and fees and regulations. I also would like to create a small business portal that'll help use the city's purchasing power and put that to play in favor of small businesses. Think about how many paper clips the city buys every year, how many iPads and you know other office supplies. If you're a small business, instead of buying this on your own, if you could purchase it through the city, that would significantly reduce your cost burden. And it would also expand the city's purchasing power and work better in terms of economies of scale. Mostly we need to reduce those regulatory burdens. I'd like to see a reduction in payroll tax particularly for the businesses that retained and rehired workers that were laid off during COVID. And we can do a lot more to create a better small business atmosphere, particularly for Asian American owned small businesses that are so vital to our economic recovery.